just to talk about the final exam. Uh, so it's, it's on Monday, 10th of December, uh, 12.30, building T28. Uh, I haven't set the exam yet, <coughs> so I'll be doing that this weekend. And it's, it should be at around 100 marks, I expect. As we discussed previously in this course, the number of questions you see in the exam is no reflection at all of the level of difficulty of it. Um, purely I just break it up as, as, it, as it needs to be broken up with it conceptually. Um, so don't read anything into the fact that there's 15 questions or four questions, or that's, that doesn't matter. Um, you can be sure that it will be mostly conceptual exam. That, by that I mean you're not writing essay questions, long style answer questions. Uh, <laughs> it takes me about two, three days to set an exam because when I say it's conceptual, I make sure that even the questions that are formula-based, that you have to understand the concepts in order to apply the formulas in the correct way. So when I say it's conceptual, I mean that you have to actually understand what the material is about in order to answer the questions. Um, and the other thing you can be sure about is that all the topics on, in the class will be covered. So. But uh, when I said it here, I haven't said it yet, um, so if I, if I spend a bit more time talking about one topic over the other, it's not that I mean that it's more important or less important. Uh, there will be all topics covered in the exam. Um, so that includes the guest lecture, the presentations that you guys all did in the class, um, my class teaching time, and then also uh, these tutorial style classes I've had on most of the Fridays. Um, so all of that type of material is, is uh, covered in the exam. Um, one important point is please bring your copy of the psychometric chart to the exam. Uh, is there anyone that doesn't have one yet? There's a few spares up here. You're welcome to grab extras if you want some to practice with over the next few days. Um, it's also available as a PDF on the course website under the drawing section of the website. Please uh, download the PDF of this and print out several copies to practice with. It will bring, a, bring at least one good copy to the exam. I will not have any with me in the exam room on the day, and you won't be able to get a copy from one of your friends either if you don't have one with you. It will be required. So that's the only piece of, it, piece of paper you actually do need to bring to the exam. Everything else you bring is optional. And I stress this actually, it should be optional. You shouldn't be bringing in mountains of material with you. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, you are certainly welcome to bring in any notes, assignments, solutions to anything, um, library books, uh, textbooks, and so on. Unfortunately, no electronic devices. I do know a few of you take notes on, on your iPad or tablet computers. Um, until we figure out a way how to deal with those, those kind of users. Oh, I certainly am not averse to it, but the university will not allow me to use them in the exams. So here's some advice. Um, I recommend you go repeat the midterm without looking at the solution. So it's probably been a month or so since you last thought about the topics that have been covered in the midterm. <coughs> without going to review the solutions, go ahead and just write the, rewrite the midterm again and see if you can understand that that style of questioning, and if you understand the concept, it really should be easy for you uh, by now. As I said, when we looked at the midterm last time, after, the, after we wrote it, we had a discussion about it, I said you should be able to come back and really find it easy. And so that's what I mean by that. Uh, we do it and, and see, how we, see how it goes. Repeat the same assignment questions that you got wrong. Um, so whenever you lost any, any grades on that, um, or even on the questions that you've got full grades for, just go look back at them and see if you could be able to redo them uh, and still understand what the concepts are about. Now here's where uh, people go wrong. People kind of get their assignments back or their midterms back and they say, well, oh, Daryl took off grades here or Kevin took off grades there. They never really understand why. Um, and say, well, okay, I thought this was how the material was, I lost grades, I didn't get this correctly. Well, adapt your learning strategy. Okay, so people who are successful at, at learning will recognize when they're not doing something in an efficient way and change their way of doing things to then figure out what went wrong. That's why it's so phenomenally important to do all the assignments 
and to do the questions in class that are presented because you get multiple opportunities to test if your learning style is successful or not. Okay, so I, I, I'll talk about it in a minute, but I do a lot of research and uh, reading in the cognitive literature and uh, learning literature, and it's, it's very clear that the common theme is that learners who are successful are the ones who adapt their learning strategy as they go along. So frequent exposure to testing and very rapid um, Seeing that you can get this right or wrong really helps you improve as a learner. So figure out what you did wrong, how can you do it better the next time if you didn't do it quite correctly. Um, if you need more practice with that, it's, there's uh, some good examples in Gene Coppolis. The solutions manual for that is all over the internet, I don't need to tell you guys that. Um, so you've certainly got ample opportunity to try out many questions from Gene Coppolis and see this textbook. Uh, both of those are, are, are good, good sources to, uh, to go from. I will also post practice questions to the course website. These won't be my questions. These will be, uh, I've got binders going back to 1984 for this course, for all the midterms and exams and everything. So I'll just post, post some of those uh, and sometimes with solutions to the course website over the coming weekend. Uh, I'll type some of those up and post them for you to go through. Okay, so here again, this is probably not necessary, especially by the, by the time that you guys are in your career here at the university to look at this. This is really something we should be talking up to our second years and first year students about. But from the educational research, uh, some of the things I've, I've looked at is people who successfully learn are those who can look at a topic and prove that they understand it. Not just sit, read it and say, well, yeah, I think I understand it, so I know what's going on here. Prove it to yourself that you do actually. Um, ask yourself whether you actually understand the topic. Set questions for yourself or, or think how to answer questions related to this topic. Um, can you explain that topic to your study partner or a, or a friend or some, someone? Um, can you explain just the approach you would take to solve a complex problem? So not just even try to solve it, but actually explain why you've taken the approach you've taken and why it makes sense. Um, then down here I put some pointers on things that students who do poorly tend to do this. And this is, when I say they do this, this is based on uh, design experiments. So these are students who have been put in experimental situations and when I say that they do poorly, it's statistically significant poorly. So it uses an F test and studies the variability amongst the students. And it's, it's very clear from this research that distractions when you're studying are not as productive. Um, if you simply just skip over parts that you don't understand. And if you are the type of person who tries to just repeat the text literally back, so without putting your own interpretation or your own understanding onto the material, uh, those students have been proven to have poorer, poorer performance. So again, probably not necessary to talk about this now uh, in the fourth and fifth year students, but it is something to be aware of. So let's just quickly then uh, give an overview of the course of what we've covered over the past uh, 13 weeks. And I just start off by, by pointing out what we looked at in the very first class. We said right at the beginning of this course that the reason why we're looking at separation processes is because they appear in so many places. Um, on the flow sheets, for those of you that are taking 4N and looking at various flow sheets, you probably noticed that a vast majority of your systems are separators. Um, if you, in most of your other courses, 3G, you probably also may have picked up on that. That a, a good chunk of the, the capital investment in the process and a good chunk of the operating costs in the process are due to separators. That's why I asked you in your course project to look at capital and operating costs as well. We noticed that in the class presentations how substantial those operating costs can be in many situations. Um, we see examples of, of separations all around us. I've listed a few examples that you've seen in your everyday life. But then also the main thing to recognize is the reason why we're doing all of this is just because we can't overcome that second law of the dynamics. We, everything tends towards the state of mixing, mixing and high degrees of entropy. We're trying to always undo that with the separation process. So then we had this slide up right at the start of the course as well that 
gave an outline of how I, uh, when I was reorganizing this course material based on how it's been done in the past 20, 20 years or so, I decided to reorder it to make it, to take it from a different conceptual angle. We started off by looking at mechanical separations, so sedimentation, thickness, clarifiers, and all of those combined. We then looked at screens to uh, get an idea of particle size distribution. We looked at centrifuges and cyclones. So all of these, you can also see a step that do some form of dewatering. They're separating the liquid from the solid. They're dewatering in many situations. And we're providing that um, a uh, separating agent that is usually in the form of just gravity itself or some externally applied force um, over there. So mechanical separations all the way. We spent about four weeks on that. Then we looked at physical barriers. Now we didn't look at filters, but we did start with our membrane section by looking at microfiltration, which the equations for microfiltration are identical to the equations for just general filters. So I purposely omitted the topic of filtration because we were covering it essentially in the section of microfiltration. So if you ever do come across filtering equations, you won't find them unfamiliar. But I, I focused in on membranes because that's a, a, it was a newish topic for me and for, for most of you in the class. Um, and so we spent about two to three weeks on, on, on looking at membranes. And I'll, I'll go come to that in a minute. We unfortunately did not get a chance to look at dialysis. Uh, we did look at reverse osmosis, and when we looked at, at, at these membrane type separations, we didn't always emphasize the bioseparations part of it. Uh, we did recognize that many membranes are used for viruses and bacteria separations, but we never explicitly looked at some case studies around that. Uh, so again, the, the decision on how much coverage to give the membrane topic, we already spent three weeks um, on, on the topic, so we didn't go into too much more depth. However, I will emphasize here that for the bio people, uh, what we did cover is, is adequate for you to understand how membranes are used in the bio area. You certainly wouldn't be at a loss if you, if you had to do this in, in your career in the future. Uh, essentially apply the same ideas and concepts, but just on a bio scale. Then we moved down here to mass transfer separations with like liquid liquid extraction and Kyle and Chad spoke about supercritical fluid extraction. So we spent uh, a few classes here on that. Then we moved over to solid fluid separations that are based in a column. And we only looked here at adsorption. I decided to omit ion exchange because if you look at the formulas and the concepts for ion exchange, they're identical to adsorption. The only difference is we're exchanging ions while we're moving through that packed bed. But no difference otherwise. The same equation, same, same principles for modeling the system. So we didn't cover ion exchange explicitly. And then chromatography, unfortunately, I didn't get to cover that. That's a three-week topic um, that definitely is interesting. But uh, for many of you, you probably won't come across chromatography, and if you do, the literature on chromatography is fairly specialized. That would, uh, would take a little bit to get into, but understanding the principle of a column-based separation that we looked at in adsorption, we're now just applying that to chromatography, except there's a slight difference there in how the material is being held back on the column and then um, being eluted through at different rates. So, we conceptually similar to adsorption, but the time required to cover it properly, we just don't have for this single semester course. And then we ended off the last section here this week by just looking at drying. Again, I omitted two topics I would have liked to cover, evaporation and crystallization. Um, but again, my principle has been that we'd rather cover one or two topics fairly, uh, fairly concisely but not everything in a hurry manner. So unfortunately, we didn't get to cover evaporation and crystallization this year. Now, if you're concerned about where material fits into different parts of the course, if, um, I probably don't need to tell you guys this because you're here, but for those of you who are not here, um, you would probably benefit from that web page link there, the course videos page, which lists um, I think there's about 35 videos there now, 1,500 very long minutes of me talking. Um, but it is what is nice is that it's sequential by date order, and uh, the topics are then listed in the second column that was covered in that class. 
There's the video uh, link that you can download the MP4 file, or you can watch it in, on the website itself. Uh, so that helps you show if, if you know, like, if you want to, like, what was colored when. This will tell you uh, when when that was. Okay, so let's just uh, take a quick recap here. Then the mechanical separations. We spent four weeks. Um, I divided the semester up into the 13 weeks of teaching. First week was just an overview, so week two, three, and four, we covered mechanical separations. Uh, so here's just, I just threw up there the topics I considered to be important from that section. We were mainly looking at designing sedimentation vessels. And we got into this topic fairly slowly. Um, we spent a while looking at this main formula down here, this, uh, Total setting velocity of an unhindered particle. And we spent so much time on this formula because it comes up in a few other places again. Now, this formula, if we're in the region where Reynolds number is less than 1, we can simplify that drag coefficient to be 24 over the Reynolds number, substitute that back in over here, and simplify this quadratic expression to uh, what's essentially Stokes' law. So Stokes' law was widely used in the centrifuges as well. And that gives me the terminal second velocity of a particle, which I can then go use in this formula for the flux in that sedimentation vessel to get an estimate of the, of the vessel size, given the flow rate Q. We also looked at topics around <coughs> flocculation. We just looked at a brief video of that and, and why flocculation is important in, in sedimentation vessels. So, a lot of basic concepts here. If you look back and just look at the slide, you say, wow, that's a, such a few topics, but we spent three weeks on that, uh, sorry, three classes on that. Um, and the reason is because we were just getting into the ideas of separation factors, um, and I wanted to, to talk a bit about this equation so we understand it really well. It, it's kind of in, in many places, fluidized beds, centrifuges, and, and in other situations as well. So we really did need to understand that thoroughly. Then we spent a class on looking at screens. We looked at sphericity as, as one way of judging a particle. But then also here, importantly, we looked at equivalent diameters. So these are when we're dealing with non-spherical particles. So for example, a good example is here in this drying case study. If I had pellets that I was drying, so I had extruded pellets that were maybe cylindrical in shape. If I look back at those heat transfer coefficients for H in the drying literature, the drying literature for the heat transfer coefficient assumes spherical particles. If I have cylinders that I'm drying, to use those heat transfer coefficients, they require an estimate of dp, the diameter of the sphere. Now, I don't have a spherical particle. So what these equivalent diameters do is say, what would be this, the equivalent diameter of a sphere that has the same volume as these cylindrical particles? Or what is the equivalent diameter of a sphere that has the same surface area as these cylindrical particles? And if we're looking at drying, which one of those equivalent diameters would be the most appropriate to use? The one with the same surface area, right? So surface area then is clearly the interesting factor in the drying situation. So we can then calculate what is the equivalent surface area of that cylindrical particle, and say, given that surface area, what would be the diameter of the sphere with that same surface area? And then use that diameter then in those heat transfer coefficient equations. So we, we, we spoke a bit about that in that section. Recap that just to make sure you understand it. We also looked at, at mesh sizes, and then the concept of these differential and cumulative curves that show the particle size distribution either on a differential or cumulative basis. The next uh, section then we looked at centrifuges. Here again, Stokes' law came up. Um, here, so it's two times the terminal settling velocity multiplied by a sigma factor, and sigma varied based on whether it was a tubular bulb or this called centrifuge. And we saw centrifuges plenty of times during the course presentation, so I'm sure we're pretty comfortable with this topic. The next one we looked at, uh, again, just a short time, mainly because the flow and the modeling of these cyclones are so incredibly complex that um, we really can't get into it. The cyclone then, we just introduced the principle of operation, and then we looked at the 
at this great efficiency curve, which essentially tells us how efficient we are at sending material out in the course or the underflow stream. So GX is defined as the ratio of the particle size to flow in the course stream divided by the feed stream. So just recap how to interpret this plot and, and the slopes on the plot based on its points along the x-axis. So that was an important part of cyclones. Then we moved on to three weeks or so of membranes. Um, as I said, we started off with microfiltration, which really is essentially the filtration equation. So that's essentially this equation up here, flux is equal to the pressure drop divided by the resistance. The resistance is made up of two parts, the membrane itself and the cake being built up on the membrane. So that equation is exactly the same as the filtration equation for regular filters. It applies for microfiltration as well. We move into ultrafiltration and then finally reverse osmosis. As we go down that list, our delta pressures get higher and higher, and the particle sizes we retain get smaller and smaller. So understand what the relative uh, changes are there between those different membranes. Understand what the relative uh, liters per minute uh, uh, sorry, these would be in straight per hour are elevations. Understand also when we can and when we cannot set CP, the permeate concentration, rather equal to zero. So those, those topics are important over there. Um, also, understand when we can and when we cannot disregard the membrane resistance and then the cage resistance. So as I said, we've got those two resistances over there. We tend to set them equal to zero in some cases and in other cases not. So. So make sure you recap that, that those concepts over there. And then finally, uh, these permeances, P sol divided by the thickness of the membrane. So that term we lumped up together and we call that the permeance. We have the permeance of the solvent and the permeance of the solute. Understand how we calculate those and how we use them. And also, just be aware throughout this entire membrane section that the units can change on you depending on whether we're using volumetric flows or whether we're using mass flows. So, some several several important uh, learning items under the membrane topic. Then we moved on to liquid liquid extraction for uh, a few classes, where we maybe there's just a ton of new concepts over here, some of which were familiar from the chemistry um, undergraduate classes, ternary diagrams, the lever rule, tie lines, and equilibrium. I mean, we pulled that all together by looking at how exocephalus worked. Uh, we look at distribution coefficients, extract streams, raffinate streams, and, and you guys are, are working through an assignment now on this, so this is in the top of your head. Um, so none of this should be strange to you. Um, we then ended off this section by looking at countercurrent operation and then operating on the operating point that's out there on the raffinate side of the terminal regard. So plenty of new concepts there, but relatively straightforward material, especially given that it's a Graphical nature, it's easy to understand what's going on here. Then, adsorption section, um, we looked at, at three isotherms the Langmuir, the Freundlich, and then the linear isotherm, which is really this early part of these two isotherms are also being considered linear. The concept of breakthrough through a packed bed, uh, we studied for, for a while, and then the mass transfer zone. The length of unused bed is that small tip of the bed there that's always needed in addition to the section for the mass transfer zone. So it's always a constant size that's added on at the end of the pack bed in order to account for that small region then as, as we start breaking through. Uh, just one note here, and this is important for the assignments as well, is on this pyramid uh, on the Langmuir isotherm. Here we've written it up in this form on board, CAS, to K3 times CA divided by 1 plus a constant K4 times CA. We can also re express that in terms of constant K5 times CA divided by K6 plus CA. So sometimes we simply divide top and bottom through here by, divide top and bottom through here there by K4. And we'll get two new coefficients, K5 and then K6 plus CA. This form over here is easier to work with than the form that's written up there. 
So the constant times the co concentration divided by another constant plus the concentration. And that's the one that I'm asking you in assignment question one uh, to, to calculate those coefficients. And please do not use the line we method. That method is error prone. Use the E.D. Hofsky method. Um, and I gave, gave the link for that in the, in the course notes. So the E.D. Hofsky method will estimate those coefficients K5 and K6 for you uh, far more accurately than the line view revert plot, which is probably what you've been using in your, in your other bio courses. But uh, given that people who teach those bio courses are not stats people, they probably didn't, don't, are not aware of the, the technicalities of that. So, so that was important in the adsorption section. We looked at supercritical fluid extraction from uh, Chad and Gwen. And in addition to that, the other presentations are also uh, of importance. And finally, the section here on dry, and since it's so recent, I really don't need to recap what we've covered. So let me just end off here with saying um, there's some common themes that you must understand in all the sections. It's the separation factor, the concentration of the recovered component, the recovery of that component, what is the mass agent, what's the energy separating agent, and what phases are involved. So make sure you can answer those questions for all the, all the separation steps we looked at. Um, in every separator, make sure that you can understand what the principle is being used, what are the phases present, what affects the unit's cost, what variables are important to that unit's operation. And so most of the time as engineers, we will not be designing these units, we'll be troubleshooting these units. So speaking to colleagues, 80% of their time will spend troubleshooting units Understanding which are the variables that affect that unit's operation is more important than being able to design the unit itself. Um, so, and then the other one is how can you repurpose an existing unit for different use? So we looked at that actually in the midterm. We were taking it at an existing centrifuge and we were using it for sand and oil separation. Okay, so unfortunately I've, I've run out of time. So I just want to end off here by just thanking you for everything. Um, for your feedback and comments in this course. We're doing this the first time I'm teaching this, this material and overhauling it. You guys are the guinea pigs for this course. Um, you may not know, but sometimes I just learned the material like an hour or two before I taught it. <laughs> um, so, so I appreciate all the feedback that you've given me and, and patience that you've shown with some of the delays in this course. Um, if there's anything else you'd like to say, please let me know in person or by the course website or via the evaluation. So thanks again and I'll see you in the exam.